Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My guest today is Kate Lehrer, the author of Out of Eden. Welcome, Kate. Well, thank you for having me, Teresa. It's wonderful to be here. The new book's Out of Eden. And I suppose we're not talking about Eden and original sin, but we're talking about the metaphorical Eden in historic Kansas. Why historic Kansas? Well, in fact, the story really took place. This much of the story is true. Two women met in Paris in 1880 and decided to homestead in Kansas. So from that, I built a whole book around this idea that why would they go to Kansas and what did it mean once they got there? You know, what would happen to them to take people out of their known familiar settings and put them into another world entirely. And they'd lived in exotic settings too. Absolutely. Uh, the, the French woman was an aristocrat. The American woman was from the East Coast and was from an affluent family. And again, that much was true. And so it was taking these two women and why would they go to Kansas? which actually was considered an Eden. It was, it was written about as the land of milk and honey. Mm -hmm. and many people at that point would go, and they were going all over Europe. The railroads were going over to uh, Europe, saying, you'll know, come, come to Kansas, come west, mm -hmm. all west. They were trying to get some business for their railroads. They needed and, freight. And then they built houses. Tell us about that. All right, this, this also is part of what the, the, the real women did. They homesteaded each her 160 acres and built twin houses with a crosswalk between them on the prairie of Kansas. Mm -hmm. So this is, and then with, then, then problems start, of course, as problems always tend to do in life. But they did build twin houses and they furnished them with things that they had brought with them from France mostly. You keep mentioning the real women, and that's as opposed to the fictional women. Why did you decide to write this story as fiction? I think that's, that's what I do. I write fiction. It's more interesting to me this way. The fact is, even if I'd wanted to write it as history, there's not enough to know about those women, really, mm -hmm. to, to write. Mm -hmm. And what interested me was to go down into their motivation, which I never could have known. I, there was nobody knows. It was, it, was, it was a mystery as to why they mm -hmm. came to Kansas, whatever possessed them. Mm -hmm. And then it's a mystery to what happened to them, really, once they got there, mm -hmm. other than you know, a very brief, sketchy bit. I was interested in just thinking about what happens to any two people who are involved um, in a situation of trust. Mm -hmm. and, and then maybe betrayal. And then maybe betrayal. And then maybe betrayal. And what goes on. And I wanted to explore that issue. Mm -hmm. As such, I had a wonderful time, though, with imagining how these, these issues play out putting them all in a real historical context because I tried to make the book as accurate historically as possible. I was going to ask you about that. How important is that when, you, when you're doing fiction based on fact? Is it very important to get those details right? Do you still have to observe convention? Oh, it seemed to me it was extremely important. I, I really wanted to think about all the forces that would truly have been playing on them at the time because it seems to me always that with in our lives right now. It's the external as well as the internal forces. Mm -hmm. It's the combination that uh, we react to mm -hmm. and we act upon. So that that's absolutely what I was trying to do in this. It seemed to me extremely important to get it right. For instance, in the beginning, I thought they came to Kansas in 75. Mm -hmm. And I'd done a lot of research mm -hmm. by that time. Mm -hmm. I just had to throw it all away because they did not come until 80. And I mm -hmm. thought, no, I want them there in their time. They deserve mm -hmm. their time, which was, but it was wonderful. As you went about your research, and, and I know you wanted to get nail down some of these details and to get the right times, uh -huh. what other sorts of things besides the details? Were you trying to find the temper of the times as well? Oh yes, I spent so much time. I, I went back and I read the kinds of books I read. Of course, I got the details, you know, what people wore, what they were doing, but also the cultural trends of the time. Uh, this was the Gilded Age, I was so happy to learn. It's not Little House on the Prairie, <laughs> and it's not the Wild West. Uh -huh. This is the Gilded Age. Even in Kansas, it was the Gilded Age, as, is, as really it was in most of the West. A little more rustic in mm -hmm. many ways, but you're talking 
bringing traditional values, the cultural values to a, to a place and have them play out. It's much freer and more open than it is either in Europe or on the East Coast. But essentially, you are talking about this age where on the surface everything is self-confidence. Mm -hmm. um, we think we can do anything as a nation at that mm -hmm. point, and mm -hmm. people thought they could do anything. One of the wonderful little details and facts I discovered is that people thought they could actually change the weather. Oh, <laughs> yeah. and how? Let's do yeah. that. Well, they, by getting enough people in one place, because nobody kept records mm -hmm. of the weather, and if, so if you came west, you got enough civilization there, and therefore it would change. Well, now, as we know, there is a little truth to it in that you mow all the trees down, you don't get as mm -hmm. much rainfall. It's, uh, these things are now happening with our rainforest, places like that. Mm -hmm. But that takes hundreds of years, too, for it all to come about. These people really thought you just, you sort of willed the weather mm -hmm. the way you could will the rest, you could will laws. Mm -hmm. As you immersed yourself in that time period, did you find yourself looking at contemporary times differently? I found so many fascinating parallels between then and now. The last quarter of the 19th century and the last quarter of our century. I did see it. I, I did find myself taking a much longer view of now than probably I would have and realize that the passions that are stirred up now were very much the very same as then politically, economically, culturally, in every way, even with the, the uh, because I went back and studied the feminism of the mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. even what was going on in terms of that impulse in, of women to be, to push the envelope mm -hmm. then as well as now, mm -hmm. uh, and the reaction to women who do that, it was fascinating to see the similarities. You know, I think the details you choose, the historical details, the visual details, all resonate with that, and particularly in your prologue. And could I get you to read this prologue? Oh, sure. I love this, and it passes the jealousy uh, test for me, Kate. As I read this, I thought to myself, I wish I had written that. That's good. Well, I, I love hearing that, Teresa, because <laughs> so, I respect you as a writer. Oh, thank so, you. Yes. Um, did the women build all of this? the willows, the pond, were these a part of their grand scheme? Not so long ago on the high plains of western Kansas, tucked among wheat fields and sand hills, stood two identical houses demanding notice, exacting respect. Their still graceful shapes remain cradled in a hollow, but the wood is now stripped of paint, the roofs and windows in disrepair, one front door ajar. The rotted walkway in between tantalizes with its boarded entrances, board upon board, the only secured portals in either house. Does this walkway provide a clue to secrets long forgotten? There should not have been so great a toll on such a dream, for they had stood tall and proud, these twin sentinels against the night. Like ancient cities now in ruins, no longer rampant with avarice and aspiration. Their mysteries are left for later generations to ponder, to encounter from their own dimension in time and place. Since the pettiness of the human heart is matched only by its bountifulness, the questions are always the same. What inspires and what destroys? Mm. Boy, that's gorgeous. Did it take you a long time to write that? Do you did know? It did not. It, it took me, well, it took me a long time in the sense that I wrote the prologue after I wrote the book. <laughs> so from that standpoint, it took me a long time. It took me that long to get to the prologue. But when I wrote it, it, it pretty much came out as it is, which is not to say I didn't go back and edit, I didn't cut down, I didn't cut out a paragraph or two, um, change a few words here or there. In fact, I think I started with what in the beginning was the second or third paragraph and realized, no, no, that's how it has to start. 
You know, you do so much in that prologue with the, with the uh, image of these twin houses. And I think you've gone a step farther than Virginia Woolf, who talked about a room of one's own. The women of day, or the women of this in this book, demanded a house of their own. That's right. They did. They felt they, w they wanted a house. They wanted to lead independent lives. They chose to lead lives of, of real independence. They didn't want to be economically dependent on a man, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, which was about the only choice most women had at that time, unless they, you know, there were very mm -hmm. few openings for women. I think your character, Lydia, summed it up so well when she said this is all about an acknowledgement of personage. That's right. They, she just wanted to be acknowledged. They wanted to be acknowledged as people. Do you relate to that? Right. As a contemporary woman, do you relate to oh, that? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think, well, I think women and men always hope that there's something in them, but women especially have a hard time still, I think, feeling that they are recognized for who they really are. And aren't, because I think for one thing, women try so hard to please and accommodate still. It's, part of it is the way we're brought up, and part of it, I think, is part of our nature, frankly, so that we're, so into that that we think, well, could somebody see behind, beneath, beyond the pleasing facade mm -hmm. of what we really are mm -hmm. and accept us for who we really are? Well, and Kate, there's so many pulls on you. I mean, you're a mother, you're a grandmother, you have a wide circle of friends, you're a, a devoted writer. Do you feel all these pulls? Do you sometimes long to go, at least metaphorically, to the plains of Kansas? Oh, absolutely, yes, and have a house of my own. And a house of your I own I have a house there. of my own, yes. The character Charlotte, at one point, says that when she goes, talking about this move to Kansas, that she's not looking for simple minds, she's looking for a simpler life. Uh, would you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, well, I think that what these women are doing, and what I think a lot of women are doing, and not just women, again, Men, we want lives that are more meaningful to us. They are looking for an authentic existence, mm -hmm. something real, so that they can get rid of the clutter in their lives. From both Paris, for instance, and New York, where they're coming from, there's mm -hmm. so many rules they have to conform to. So much of what they do is based on nothing but the busyness mm -hmm. of the day which unfortunately a lot mm -hmm. of our lives are that way. I had a friend call me up and she said, this is my life right now. I live this way, mm -hmm. uh, observing all the conventions all the time. They, weren't, they didn't want to be huge rebels. They wanted to keep friends. They wanted to have friends in Kansas, in the West, mm -hmm. but they wanted, and they wanted friends that, of people of like minds. Mm -hmm. They simply wanted to be able to pare down and do the things they thought were really important. I think you use the phrase in the book, a disciplined spontaneity, which yes. I borrow. That's another thing that passes the jealousy test. I <laughs> wish I, I had said that. But there's some risks in doing that when you depart from convention uh, oh. to a certain extent and you go and try to uh, uh, plot out new ground. That's right. And again, this business of you think these women think they can go into, into Eden. They can make the new ground as they want it, as the weather can be changed. Um, as we can just decide one day we're going to live differently, we will, no matter what, we're going to be different people. The fact of the matter is it's always very risky to plot out new ground. Mm -hmm. It's very risky in our lives every day to go out and decide we're going to do something slightly different than we did the day before. I remember reading once about uh, someone, they were trying to be more assertive. Mm -hmm. I think it was a group of women. and. Mm -hmm. One of the assignments was to go into stores and ask for change for a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> and what courage that takes mm -hmm. because you're just asking for something. You're imposing yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not going to buy anything and you could get rejected. That's never fun, I think. Oh. And that's the least of it. Oh, and yes. For these women going oh, out there, tested that's the and, least of it. And you have wonderful secondary characters like Nora, and who uh, is challenged in, in a way and has to find under a, a difficult circumstance that she can overcome her reticence. That's right, because she's, for one thing, she doesn't trust these women. Nora goes out there to work as a, a serving woman with, uh, she's a domestic with Lydia and Charlotte. And has no use for them. She's used to being very contained herself. Talk about 
disciplined uh -huh. spontaneity. She's very contained. And then suddenly she's able to break out of it and trust and open herself up in many ways more than either of the other two women do or any of the women who come. Kate, we want to talk more about dreams and more about your work. Stay, stay right where you are. We'll be back with more on Out of Eden. This is an RSU-TV Encore presentation of Writing Out Loud. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome back to Writing Out Loud. I'm visiting with Kate Lehrer, the author of Out of Eden. Kate, so many of your novels, uh, your, your novel previous to this was when they took away the man in the moon and now Out of Eden seemed to be the loss of our, our dreams. Uh, it's not in Eden, it's out of Eden. Uh, are dreams mortal? Oh, I think dreams are very mortal as a matter of fact. Um, I think dreams can only last for so long and I think it's what we do. I think maybe we, if we're lucky, we keep having new dreams. We hope we can continue having dreams. But I think, and I think they're part of the human condition, but also part of the human condition is mortality. Mm -hmm. So therefore, dreams are very mortal and very precarious. And very keyed to the people we love. And very keyed. There's not much we can do except continue to dream most of the time. In fact, even though we have emphasized that this book takes place in Kansas, it seems to me that, that people dominate place wherever. And there's that wonderful line from Charlotte after her father dies in France that after Papa was gone, France wouldn't exist for her anymore. How did you feel when you wrote that line? I felt that sometimes when, we, when there's very much loss in a life, the loss of people we really love, for instance, the loss of a real dream, that in fact the whole reality changes and a whole world vanishes for us. It, it's no longer the same world we once knew and we have to go on from there. And there are other kinds of losses of course with, with her father there was death but before that betrayal and this book is a lot about betrayal. That's right. Betrayal between parents and children, uh, betrayal between friends, betrayal between spouses, there's betrayal all the way through because betrayal is also part of dreams, unfortunately. We betray our own dreams a lot of times, I think. And that's the most and our, yes. frustrating kind, isn't That it? is the most frustrating kind because we, that we think we can control. Charlotte lost her father. Uh, and when the, in your other novel, when they took away the man in the moon, the character has lost a father. You lost your father when you were quite young. How has that affected your writing? I think it's probably, it probably informs all my writing, which I'm not so sure I understood in the beginning when I started writing. Even in my first book, there's an absent father. The father's just never there. Mm -hmm. And what this means is to do without a parent, uh, whether it's a father or a mother, I think. I think that affected, it, it, it gives a person with this loss, with an early loss, a keen sense of, uh, back to the word precarious, mm -hmm. the precariousness of life and how we're going to compensate for that, what we do to deny a mm -hmm. lot of times that yes indeed it is as precarious as, as uh, some instinct in us tells us it is. And we, it pulls us down deeper. Mm -hmm. We can't quite ignore the fact that loss surrounds us mm -hmm. and could happen to us again any second, probably too much so. We and know then, this. And I wonder if that has contribu contributed to your being a character-based writer more than a plot-based writer. Well, I so think your plots so. are good. Well, I know, but I'm, I'm, the plots only get me so far. I mean, in terms of uh, only interest me so far. I like to have it because I love good stories. I grew up in Texas, so I, I love a good story. <laughs> At the same time, what I've always have been interested in is the why of the story. Mm -hmm. Why why did the women go to Kansas? Why do we do what we do? Why do we start our days off 
in one kind of a mood and suddenly everything either goes to the pits or we're in a much better mood before the day is over. It's, it's what is it inside us that changes us so. And everybody, all of us. I love the way that you say we because that shows how closely you are invested uh, in this book and how much you are a part of it as, as well. And I can't help but wonder, you know, we, we were talking earlier that the book is fiction based on fact. And in fact, it's so good. I, so I looked through it. I told you uh, earlier today that I looked for pictures because I was convinced it's so real. I was looking for pictures of the character in the middle of, of the that. book. <laughs> but is all fiction to a certain extent based on fact? I think it is in the sense that we've got to have some experience back there. It, it's not so much that it's the same fact. It's not so much that we've been disinherited or even that a parent has been lost or, or whatever the incident is. It's based on the fact of our emotions mm. and whatever we can bring up from those emotions. If, if, we're, if we were an actor, for instance, our, we might be told, okay, think of the loss of a dog in order to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, portray on the stage mm -hmm. the loss of a parent so that you can bring up different kinds of losses and get that emotion. I think for writers we bring up a kind of fact and because probably we've done a lot of reading, our uh, instinct for empathy has been overly developed as years go along <laughs> with or without a real loss so that we in that sense, it's based on that kind of fact, the fact of emotion, I would say. Well, one of the phrases you use to talk about the fact of emotion is heart calls, which I thought, again, I'm, I'm jealous yes. of that. My low character, oh. you know, generates the show. <laughs> I'm jealous of <laughs> no, heart no. calls. What sorts of heart calls, besides the loss of your father, uh, inform your writing? I think the heart calls, well, for one thing, a friend of mine called after she'd finished this book, and she said, you realize you're, you always, what I love about your books is they're always about a community of strong women. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's right, all of them, because they've been very different. The other two, you know, were contemporary works just to begin with, and totally different from this, and each different from the other. And yet there's that fascination with the strong woman mm -hmm. and, and strong women and the community of women and how women nurture each other. And you're the mother of three daughters. And I'm the mother of three daughters. And I was brought up, I was an only child, but I was brought up in a Texas matriarchy. My mother had five sisters but and we, one brother. But we so, should mention that you're married to a writer. And I'm married to a writer, yes, who's much more prolific than I am. Talk about jealousy. <laughs> How does that work when two writers live together? Do you exchange your work? Do you get uh, feedback on each other's work? We do. We don't do it as much as we used to. I mean, we wait longer in the process because we feel like now, if we get too close, it's you can't see the forest for the trees. If, if I know too much about it, this way, we, what we now need is a long view from each other. But I must tell you, when we first began, he actually started his writing before I did because I got immersed in bringing up the children and he's mm -hmm. much faster than I am and his ideas we thought would be more sellable than mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. mine. So I would read his work and I would criticize it and it and I would I would say it very nicely. Mm -hmm. Well this is wonderful. However <laughs> and then, I hate those however. <laughs> that's right. And then through clenched teeth he would say, Well you obviously don't understand what I was trying to do <laughs> And then I through clenched teeth would say I think I do understand what you were trying to do and you did not do it. <laughs> well, within literally, and I'm not exaggerating, within four minutes we would be shouting at each other mm -hmm. and I would usually huff away saying, you know, I don't know why, well, I don't know why you can't grow up and you're so immature and you just can't accept criticism and I will never criticize you again. Well, as soon as I did start writing, mm -hmm. the situation reversed. And so, so out the window went one of my illusions, which I was much more mature. <laughs> <laughs> and could indeed accept criticism, which Jim, of course I can't. Jim's awfully high profile. He's on television nearly every night, and you mm -hmm. toured together. What was that like when you both had books out at the same time and you're touring the country? It was, it was, part of it was really fun. It was mixed for me, I must say, because, and Jim had warned me because, of course, he is much more high profile. I was nobody, and he was really somebody, so we, we went into a situation 
all weighted against me in a funny way. And of course, what I loved was the challenge mm -hmm. of an audience or an interviewer who would have read my book or picked up on my reading and become engaged with my ideas. I, and it was, very good it was very good experience and there was a lot of good exposure and I learned a lot from him because he said, you know, you've got to mm -hmm. attack questions head on, things like that. So I, I, I got a quick lesson in all those things. That said, um, it was time for me, I realized, to go out and just speak in my own voice. Mm -hmm. And there's no way for my voice not to have gotten a little drowned mm -hmm. by and such I'll a high profile person. <laughs> Let me ask you another question uh, about your writing. Uh, when, you, when you finish a book like this that you spend so much time on, is there a sense of letdown after the tour, uh, after that, that wonderful time with Jim on tour? Mm -hmm. Is there a letdown? Oh, there was a tremendous letdown, which I didn't think would be so at first. For one thing, I have tremendous performance anxiety. So that in itself was just horrendous. And the whole tour, I, I was scared to death before every before every interview like this, I would just wish I could just be anesthetized and let it be over. You know, I wouldn't know anything until it was over. That said, I realized about halfway through I had become a ham, and I <laughs> did enjoy it a lot more Good than I you. yeah than I would allow myself to think. And so it wasn't all so horrible, as I said. When I got an audience that I could really in, you know engage with or an interviewer, I thought I, I really was enjoying the uh, dialogue. I was loving it, and I remember the last reading I gave uh, before a, a group, I'd gone to a writer's conference, and I was, you know, I'd been talking about writing and my writing, and I read a little bit, and I thought, this is the last time anybody's ever going to ask me to read the first chapter of this book out loud. <laughs> and it, had, it was one of those chapters that I would look out in the audience and, and People, it was a tearjerker. I didn't write it that way, but in fact, I would always elicit tears, and that I realized had become really fun <laughs> to make that, people cry. That you had touched lives. That I'd touched lives. That all those months of isolation, you had built bridges to other houses, exactly a secret right. passageway. Yes. Kate, you close the, the book with the expression uh, to dream is to pray, and we'll close the show with that thought. Thank you for being here. Congratulations on Out of Eden. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.